Greetings to all of you. So why do I, trained as a quantum physicist, work on seed freedom? And what is seed freedom? For me, after this journey of more than three decades, seed freedom for me is first and foremost this little acorn having the intelligence and brilliance to turn into an oak tree. It doesn't need constant instruction to say, don't become a coconut, don't become a coconut. <laughs> Machines need external control. Machine-like human beings need to be constantly told what to eat, need to be constantly told what to think, who they are, the seed is the ultimate expression of life as self-organized brilliance and intelligence in evolution, not static. So the mechanistic view of the universe basically is a very recent error. It's a mistake, but it was a very convenient mistake. Because if you declare nature as dead, then you can't kill her, right? She's already dead. And very close to here, the New England governor, Boyle, had said, the idea of reverence for nature is a major impediment over our empire over inferior creatures. Now, the inferior creatures, of course, meant all life, the trees and the plants, the bison. The mistake was, why was the bison not associated with rights? Because she wasn't in prison. And that was development. To let a bison roam free over the prairies was a defective part, and inferior creatures included the First Nations. And if you wonder why the First Nations of this land are called Indians, it's because actually Columbus wasn't seeking this land. He didn't know it existed. He was coming to India. You know, we were the source. We were 25% of the global economy when the British came. It's our textiles and our spices that brought the whole world. We used to send this out. But then the colonizers thought, wow, if we could control it, the wealth will be ours. I worked on forest issues in Western Ghats, which is the spice belt. It's called the Pepper Queen. A sack of pepper seeds used to be exchanged for a sack of gold. A sack of the indigo that before the chemicals, synthetic chemicals and dyes, a sack of indigo used to be exchanged for a sack of gold. These were the reasons colonization happened. And when Columbus landed here, discovered, you know, I really feel this continent could do with getting rid of the idea that Columbus discovered America. It was there, and there were people. Of course, he called the First Nations Indians. And very often when I have worked with the First Nations, Vinona Laduke, who came to me to help with the fighting of the patent on the wild rice, we did so many events where he said, let the Indians of the world unite, which means anyone colonized, which is all of us, every one of us. And the latest colonization is through the seed and through our food. The most concerned people about their diets forget the simple fact that food begins in seed. You eat rice, it has to begin in a rice seed. You eat wheat, it has to become in a wheat seed. And the quality of the seed determines the quality of food, along with all of the interactions that make the seed. This acorn 
is not isolated from the soil organisms that nourished the oak tree. <coughs> it's not isolated and separate from the pollinators that made the fruit. It, you cannot separate it from the sunshine that allowed the photosynthesis to happen. There is no way to isolate the seed from all the interactions of millennia of evolution that are all in it. It is literally, you know, the wonderful thing about quantum theory is it gets you out of this very false idea that nature is dead, nature's inert, everything's fixed, everything's determined. Quantum theory tells you everything is a relationship. Non-separability, my thesis was non-locality and hidden variables in quantum theory. Non-separability is the nature of reality, you cannot separate. And potential is the nature of reality, nothing's fixed. So right now we are going through a world situation of the potential for hate and the potential for fear. But we've been through these waves before and we cultivated other potentials. The potential of love, the potential of compassion, the potential of celebrating diversity. And that my lessons on diversity have come from the seed. I dedicated my life to seed saving when I was invited to a meeting in 1987. I just finished my study on Punjab and the Green Revolution for the United Nations. And the book called The Violence of the Green Revolution, you know, suddenly started uh, to get me invitations. It's very funny because, you know, you're supposed to become an expert when you write a book, when you are actually learning when you write a book. The book is a distillation of what you've learned and what you want to share. So at this meeting, it was called the Laws of Life, and it was on the new biotechnology. In 87, there were no GMOs. But the industry was looking at the potential to splice genes, to do recombinant DNA, to move genes from one organism to an unrelated organism. Because genes do move. The seed is a result of reproduction within species through pollination. But crossing the boundary of species, it's genetic engineering that made it possible for the first time. And the scientists who'd done the early work put a moratorium on their work. They said, we don't understand the ethical implications of moving genes across species boundaries. So we will pause to assess the implications and we won't rush into further research. Forget commercialization. So we won't even do further research till we know what responsibility we are taking. At that point, there were venture capital firms that felt here in gene splicing, there's money. Most of them died very, very soon but every one of them was bought up by the old chemical industry, which had not done the early work at all. The old chemical industry was there at this meeting, which had been hosted by the United Nations, and they had called independent scientists, they had called the chemical industry, which was now wanting to get engaged in biotechnology, and they'd called health experts and, and people like me. And there were three things that the industry said that shifted the direction of where my energies would be dedicated. The first thing they said is, we have to do genetic engineering in order to take patents on seed. A patent is an exclusive right granted to an inventor who has made, invented, made what is patented. 
and it gives the inventor the right to prevent anyone else from making, using, selling, distributing the patented object. Which is fine for machines, it's fine for the kind of mic I'm wearing to get my voice to you, it's fine for the digital timer here, it's fine for patents. Because they are machines and they do get invented. But the seed is not a machine. It's not an invention. So to declare it an invention is the first ontological flaw. And for me it was such an outrageous leap because already I dedicated my life to the protection and defense of the earth and our species and biodiversity. And I said, no, you don't invent life. And the reason they were doing genetic engineering was not because they had a GMO in their hands, but because they were seeing what exclusive rights to seed and monopoly on seed would bring them. They also said they were too small. Now we are talking about the time when Monsanto was just a chemical maker, Seba was separate from Sandoz, Astra was separate from Imperial Chemical Industries. They were all giants, but many, many, many giants. And they said, we are too small. We have to merge. And by the turn of the century, we'll be five giants controlling food and health. They put it together. And the ones who will win, the giants who will win the race, will be the ones who have the highest number of patents in their hands. And because they were talking about seed, they said so clearly that we have to write an international law that prevents farmers from saving and exchanging seed. Otherwise, why would someone come to a GMO seed? They wouldn't have a market. So they had to destroy the freedom of farmers to save and exchange seed. And the first time I heard the name GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, was at that meeting. That is the treaty that led to the World Trade Organization. And in it was an agreement called the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights. Now this too has a very interesting story because before the chemical giants tried to own the seed, we used to have six classes of intellectual, of, of, of property. Industrial property was the patents on industrial products, the machines, the chemicals. Trademarks, it's totally legitimate. Design. There was plant variety breeders' rights. These were all in the law, but they didn't have one rubric called intellectual property. Some were about creative acts, some were about industrial acts, and industrial property was the word used. With the GATT and WTO, they started to use the term intellectual property. And I remember those days, because now I got involved in watching what was happening, they would have a giant show in Bangkok. An elephant would be brought out to trample on pirates' CDs of Michael Jackson. And they'd do all this drama to make it look like it was about theft of creative work. When the real theft of creative work was the theft of creativity of nature by claiming you had invented the seed. That was the first theft. Monsanto, a few years later, actually even went on record to say, in drafting the TRIPS agreement, we were the patient, diagnostician, and physician all in one. Now, that wasn't true. Because the very fact that intellectual property had to be preceded with the term trade-related, is because I started to work with my government. I started to work with our ambassador. So we can't have ownership on seed. And the word TR was put by the Washington lawyers to say now it's in the trade treaty. It's trade related, therefore you've got to accept it. It's part of the trade treaty. But we still managed to make changes, very, very significant changes. And I'll share them with you because they affect everyone. So basically, the idea of Monsanto had been, 
will make all seeds covered by patent and those that are not illegal. And when they said we are the patient, diagnostician and physician all in one, we defined the problem, we offered a solution, we got our government to accept it and our government took it to Geneva, to the GATT, which became the WTO. When they're talking about themselves being the patient, you know what their disease was? The farmer saved seeds. Farmer saving seeds was Monsanto's problem. And the solution was, farmer saving seeds should be made illegal and intellectual property was the tool. But we managed, largely through the Indian GATT ambassador of that time, Mr. S.P. Shukla, I just visited him, he's very old now, but he and others, the Brazilians and other countries, which are rich in biodiversity, put in an exclusion clause. So that Article 27.3b reads, parties may exclude from patentability plants and animals other than microorganisms and essentially biological processes for the production of plants or animals other than non-biological and microbiological processes. However, parties shall provide for the protection of plant varieties either by patents or by an effective sui generis system or by any combination thereof. Terribly boring but very significant for life on this planet. Because if it had been written the way Monsanto wanted to, all life was going to be subject to patent. Having put the exclusion clause, I started to work with my government on the laws. Of course, even before working on that, I decided I'm going to save seeds. And, the, you know, I mean, I really had a chill when they said, we are too small, we are going to be five companies controlling food and health, and patenting of seed will be our tool of becoming these giants. It was a scary idea. And my mind went to Gandhi. You know, the empire, the British empire, which controlled all of this land, you, and you had the Boston Tea Party, remember? Little tea party down there. The empire of the British East India Company was a cotton empire. It was a, I mean, the narrative has been made to look like it's the mills of England that created the empire. No, the mills came 200 years later. First came colonization, taking the land of the First Nations, <laughs> capturing people on the African continent to bring them to work in the cotton plantations as slaves. Of course, colonizing India, destroying our textiles. In our history books, we used to read that the thumbs of the weavers, you know, when you, win, when you move the shuttle, you need your thumb. They cut the thumbs of the master weaver so they couldn't teach the next generation five me. All of this and the distorted laws and free trade agreements of that time went to establish an empire of cotton. It's only at the end the mills came. It's only at the end the fossil fuels came. But Gandhi responded to this empire in a very creative way he pulled out a spinning wheel. He said, we are colonized by destroying our ability to make cloth. We are forced to consume the mill-made cloth. But we can be free if we make our own cloth. And the, when people would laugh at him and say, how do you think a few pieces of wood will bring you freedom from the huge military empire. And he said, it's the only thing that can, because it'll be in the hands of the last woman in the poorest house. And when the last person starts to join the movement for freedom by making their own cloth, we will be free. So, you know, I'm trained in physics and math, so I made a matrix. I said, first industrial revolution, 
empire of cotton, raw material is cotton. Spinning wheel is the symbol of liberation. The chemical revolution came, poor Rachel Carson tried to wake us up. We didn't wake up to the level we should have. And now the third industrial revolution was the industrialization of life. And the fourth industrial revolution is the 5G waiting out there. Um, the industrialization of life, I'm thinking in my head, I said, what would be the spinning wheel of today? And the seed appeared to me. I haven't attended a single class in biology. Everything I've learned about life is by living. Some young gentleman asked me before I came up, what do you specialize in? And I said, life. I have become so passionate about life and its celebration, as well as very sensitive to the harm at the smallest level. And the harm right now we are going through is so serious because it really has given us this strange situation that food which should be nourishing us has become the biggest curse for our health and well-being. And it all begins with the seed. So I started Navdanya, the movement for seed saving. Navdanya means nine seeds. And this too is a beautiful story. I just call it the seed saving movement. Um, from 87 to about 91, that's what I called it. Bij bachao. Bij is the Sanskrit word for seed. It basically means that in which life arises on its own forever and ever and ever. That's the autopoiesis in that acorn. So the Beach Bachao Andolan carried on till I was doing a seed collection in a very remote area outside Bangalore. And this area had been um, It was a forest area and it had been protected because there was a, they called him the bandit. He was on Newsweek covers all the time for a while. Um, he had big mush. Fur, fur hmm? fur runnings? No. no <laughs> I wouldn't know your guys. I'm talking about the Indian fellow. Uh, <laughs> anyway, because of him, no official went into this area. So the old seeds were still used by the peasants. And I'm counting because I'd done the Green Revolution assessment in Punjab and the monocultures of rice in one season and wheat in the other season had stared me. And I had also found it so strange that this was called high yielding agriculture because it was pathetic in biological yields. It was zero in biodiversity in terms of life. There was nothing around. So I had become fascinated with diversity and I would count. If I saw a field with three crops, I'd count the three crops. And in this particular case, I started to count this tribal peasant's field and there were nine crops. I said, wow, you're growing nine crops. And he says, yeah, Navdanya. And I said, you speak like there's some deep meaning. And he says, don't you know you're educated? I guess because I was educated, I didn't know. Because education very often has a way of making you forget the basics. And he explained to me that the nine planets, because in India, in Indian cosmology, we have the seven plus the two shadow planets for accurate uh, astrological predictions. So the nine planets and the nine crops in my field and the balance in our bodies is one continuum of harmony. And when I grow the nine crops in my field, I am taking care of the cosmos and I'm taking care of my family's health. That's the day I named our movement Navdanya. But Navdanya pronounced slightly differently can also mean the new gift. Nav can be nine and dhan is the seed. Nav 
can be new and dan is the gift. So we see in our movement of Navdanya the gift, reclaiming the gift of the commons in the seed. Because the idea of patenting is a privatization of the seed. So we've created more than 150 community seed banks around India and around the world now because as laws would change in different countries, people would turn to us and ask for help. We've um, built a, a seed freedom movement and I'd welcome all of you to go to both the website of navdanya.org to see what we do in India, but as well as the seed freedom website and, uh, and become a part of this extremely important movement. Well, in India, because I was the only one making so much noise about this, I, was, uh, I would be called by government and we wrote the, the law on plant variety protection. And I said, but farmers are the first breeders. After all, they could take one wild plant called the Oriza sativa and turn it into 200,000 rice varieties. 200,000, just think of the number. In Navdanya, we've saved 4,000. Or in Mesoamerica, they could take one wild plant called Theosinte and turn it into the thousands of corn varieties that they have and they love. They call themselves in Mexico, I've been for many public hearings around the issue of GMO corn and keeping it out and they have kept it out. And once, I remember this was in Oaxaca, there were these beautiful young girls dressed up in their traditional clothing and they were all carrying placards. We are the people of corn. And they feel it so deeply that they have managed to generate so much energy even when a president had signed six million acres of Mexico to Monsanto's GMO corn, they managed to undo that decision. And they still have court cases that have a ban on GMO corn. Of course, the GM corn is dumped as food, but the growing of it is still prohibited. So we managed in India to put farmers' rights as breeders in the law. That was the sui generis option. And in the option of excluding plants and animals and seeds from patenting, this is the clause. Plants and animals in whole or in any part thereof, other than microorganisms, but including seeds, varieties, and species, and essentially biological process for production or propagation of plants and animals, are not inventions, therefore they are not patentable. We got this law into place, but Monsanto went round to Indian seed companies claiming they had a patent and writing license agreements that they could not sell any other seed but the GMO BT cotton seed and pay Monsanto a royalty. All I knew the seed prices were growing up. I didn't have these secret contracts between the companies. But I knew the seed price of cotton had jumped from 5 rupees to 4,000 rupees a kilogram. They sell it in 450 gram packages. Divide 4,000 by 5. It's 80,000% jump. Farmers didn't have the money. But video vans would go into the village with packages of these seeds with paper to say, just put your thumbprint here, take the seed on credit, you're going to be a superman. For the first round, they tried to turn all our divinities. And in India, we have so many divinities. We have, I'm trying to turn our crores and lakhs into millions. But you know, we say 300 crores, which is 30, you know, 3,000, 3 billion. Be that's the number of species on this planet. You know? But all species for us are sacred because the divine is all everywhere. So we have so many divinities that Monsanto had a totally free play. They took 
Guru Nanak and had him market their seeds in Punjab. They had Hanuman market for them in Vidharva. And I wrote, I remember to the advertising council, I said, you can't allow this. And that was stopped. Then they adopted Superman. You'll be a Superman. And innocent peasants, when they see a god telling them, buy the seed, they take it. It would fail once, it would fail twice, it would fail thrice. The poor peasant would keep changing the name of the company, not realizing that all the companies are locked in licensing arrangements. So there was only BT Cotton from Monsanto. There's a competition commission case, an antitrust case going on in India right now on this issue. Our antitrust body has said it is a prima facie monopoly when 99% of the cotton seed is controlled by one company. That's what patents are for. Now Monsanto never had the patent, but it told the Indian companies that they did and they believed it. The technology doesn't really work because they put a toxin into the plant with the claim that it'll control the bollworm and kill the pest. But one thing I've learned is life is intelligent and life evolves. Whether it's our gut bacteria or it's the bollworm or it's the weeds in the field becoming resistant to Roundup in the Roundup ready fields of this country. Life is intelligent and it evolves. So the bollworm evolved and they did what Einstein had clearly marked as a sign of insanity. Einstein had said, a clear sign of insanity is to do the same thing again and again, expecting a different outcome. So the ball guard one was one toxic gene in the plant. Monsanto tried to solve the problem of emergence of resistance by putting two toxic genes in the plant. Same thing, expecting a different outcome, faster resistance evolution. But now they went to the Indian companies and said, you pay us more. Because now they're two toxic genes. And the Indian companies by now were getting extremely worried because since Monsanto entered India in 98, they entered, the suicides in the cotton belt started. We'd never seen farmer suicides in India. The figure in the farmer suicides is the latest is 310,000. Two years ago, the government, the, Monsanto managed to get the government to stop releasing this data now. But till two years ago, it was 310,000, of which 84% is in the cotton areas. You know, we know where the cotton grows. We know it's 99% Monsanto. Any debt and any suicide in the cotton belt is related to BT cotton. So the Indian seed company said, we're very sorry. Our farmers are already in debt and are dying because of the royalty we are collection, collecting to pass on to you. So we can't. Then Monsanto started to sue them. As a result of which they ring me up and say, you know, this case has now become a patent issue because they're saying we've infringed a patent and we've never looked at patents. So can you please help? So I started to intervene in the cases, in the, first in the High Court and then in the Supreme Court. And very, very recently in the Supreme Court, the Monsanto lawyers were there saying, we put a chemical in the plant and it's now become a super plant. And they're acting like that. Because they, now it has been exposed in the High Court that they cannot have a patent on the plant under Article 3J. So they're running away from the patent of the plant and claiming it was for a chemical. They did not manage what they were wanting to seek, which was to knock down the law. But the power over media is such that the day the court sent back the issue to the lower court for trial, instead of knocking down Article 3J, all over the Indian press it was Monsanto won a patent. No, 
No, they did not. I got calls from the media. I had to write just as much as one of the first thing our current prime minister did when he came to visit the United States was agree to change our patent laws, including patent laws like 3J, because it is a legal interference in Monsanto's seeking monopoly. And uh, when a commitment was made by Prime Minister Modi to President Obama, I wrote an open letter to both of them. I said, how can it be said that India's legislation, which grows out of the recognition that we are one Earth family, we are one Vasudeva, Kutumbakam, Vasundara is one of the expressions of the divinity of the divine goddess, Vasundara. Kutumbakam is her family. Vasudhev Kutumbakam is the way we think of our lives, that we are members of one earth family. We cannot claim to have invented our brothers and sisters who are plants and animals. And if our law excludes patenting of plants, animals and seeds, that is the higher ethical and ecological law, not the law in the United States which says everything is patentable. Now, at the time where we were using our particular law to reject clauses or, and claims on patenting of seed, there was a very a, a particular case of uh, Monsanto had applied for a patent on climate resilience. You know, now that climate resilience has become a necessary trait in agriculture. They had wanted a monopoly on climate resilient traits. They've actually taken patents on climate resilience. Now they're not taking patents through genetic engineering. You know, that was basically the, the attempt to enter the patenting door. I always say genetic engineering was not the end. Patenting of seed was the end. And now it doesn't matter. They're trying so hard to patent everything. I mean, Syngenta has just lost a big issue in the European Parliament uh, Patent Office where they had patented a traditional tomato, not a genetically engineered tomato, conventional broccoli, soybean. So having entered the door, they now are patenting non-genetically engineered products. We've saved so many seeds, and when I started to save seeds, I wasn't going to ask the question, is this useful or not? Because I don't think nature's stupid. Nothing she's given us would be useless. And I don't think our ancestors were stupid. Every seed they bred has a function. So we just saved whatever. Among the seeds we'd saved in the Bay of Bengal coast, which is the most severely hit by cyclones and hurricanes because of climate change. We had a super cyclone in 1999, three times the velocity of normal cyclones. But we'd saved these salt tolerant seeds. And with the salt tolerant seeds, we could build back agriculture. Of course, they were waiting with hybrid seeds and they were big sacks. I remember being there in the rehabilitation work and there were big sacks from the United States and uh, for food relief. And the peasants said, we can't eat this stuff, please bring rice. So I took a sample and I sent it back to this country for testing. And sure enough, it was a mix of GMO soya and GMO corn being sent as food relief. We managed to get the government of India to stop it. But when I wrote a letter to the U.S. ambassador to say this was not right because we didn't allow GMOs in our food. The letter I got back is Americans are eating it. So what's your problem? Because GMO corn and soy is in all the food that's industrially processed. Anyway, so now climate resilient traits, which are three primarily, at the end of it all climate havoc is either a cyclone and hurricane, which brings salt on the land, or it's intense flooding, or it's an extended drought, 
of the kind you're having in California, of the kind Europe has had this year. And I don't call it climate change because climate change makes you feel, oh, in a gentle way, it'll keep going up slowly into 1.5 degrees. No, it changes through havoc. Your cold winter this year is part of that havoc. So I prefer to use the term climate chaos rather than climate change because we've ruptured the Earth's ability to regulate her climate systems. So climate resilient seeds are very, very important and we'd save the climate resilient seeds, so we knew they're there. And then I'd see suddenly Monsanto putting ads that they've invented climate resilient traits. And I know a lot of fellow ecologists who fell for this, who felt, oh, this is something that we can't do as ordinary people. Because people who do only climate change kind of live in the stratosphere, you know? They look at 350 parts per million, you know? They look at numbers up there. They're not on the ground. So they have no idea there's climate resilient seeds anyway. So now what they're doing is using digital mapping. So you steal the seeds and you know that tolerant to salt, or you steal the seeds, you know it's tolerant to drought. It's all in the seed and in its passport data that is available in public seed banks. And then you put it through software program screening and make a bet. I want to read out to you how 1,500 climate resilient patterns had been taken by the poison cartel of three using a program in by a company called Evergene. Evergene in Israel has patented a computer program for reading the plant genome. Its propriety in silico gene discovery technology is called Athlete. In silico as opposed to in vivo, in vitro refers to the investigation performed through the use of a computer or computer application. Athlete is a computer database and analysis program for finding gene function by comparing sequences from as many different plant, tissues, organs, growth conditions as possible. Evergene claims its database has 8 million express sequences and 4 million propriety gene clusters of 30 plant species. And basically, as Evergene accepts, we use fast amounts of available genomic data, mostly public, to rapidly reach a reliable limited list of candidate genes with high relevance to a target gene of choice. Allegorically, the athlete platform could be viewed as a machine that is able to choose 50 to 100 lottery tickets from amongst the hundreds of thousands of tickets with the high likelihood that the winning ticket will be included among them. This is casino. It's not breeding. It's not even knowing what you're doing. It's knowing someone else has done it. How now can I use algorithms to claim this as my invention? We've managed to stop this as an international system as we've had to use the Convention on Biological Diversity again and again and again. We used it first to even create the international framework on biosafety in the context of genetically engineered organisms being released in the environment. Then Monsanto had bought up a patent from a company called Delta and Pineland, with the which, with, which with the United States Agriculture Department had worked on what is called the terminator seed. How many of you have heard of it? Well, basically the terminator seed was genetically engineering a seed and releasing a lethal toxin at the time when the embryo was forming in the seed. So in effect, you would have sterile seed. So when I was listening to the announcements on the wheat grass, I said, no, wheat grass from terminator seed or wheat, you're not going to have germination. And this was a way to counter the deficiency 
that only certain crops have been hybridized. Soybean, for example, is not. So for the two ways in which there's control over the future generation of seed, one is law, which is the patent issue, but to implement it, you need to have an entire structure of policing. And I want to give you some examples of what this policing has meant. Hybridization means you create seed that doesn't breed too, so farmers are forced to buy seed every year. But by putting terminator technology, you can ensure that no seed can be saved because now it's in the biology of the seed to terminate itself. But can you imagine a world where Bija, the very source of life, is robbed of its life? And because it was so outrageous, we mobilized the Convention on Biological Diversity to put a ban on it. I've talked often of how, whether it is the first generation of breeding, which is crossbreeding, four chemicals, we've done crossbreeding forever, but four chemicals, it's a very recent phenomenon. It's only in the last 50, 60 years. And this is what was given the name, the Green Revolution. I have watched what it did to the seed in Punjab. Because normally, when we grow food, when seed gives food, it gives food for the pollinator, it gives food for the animals, the straw, it gives food for the soil organisms, which is the straw that gets recycled. That's why Matsunobu Fukuoka, a brilliant farmer from Japan, wrote a book called The One Straw Revolution. And then it gives grain, part of which we eat, and part of which we save as seed for the next season. So seed gives rise to seed, gives rise to seed, gives rise to seed forever. And the desperate attempt of industry has to be to prevent seed from being seed, which basically means preventing creation from being creation. And that's why I often also say, for Monsanto, GMO is nothing less than God move over. Out of the way. Now we'll parade as being the creators of the universe. Technologies are extremely crude, so they couldn't manage to pump chemicals into the old varieties. So they had to make them dwarf varieties. That's all that Norman Borlaug, who got the Nobel Peace Prize for the Green Revolution in Punjab did. He made the wheat and wheat dwarf. Now you can pump a lot of chemicals and it doesn't lodge. But that means you've got rid of a very important part of the plant, the straw. And this is the reason you're feeding so many animals and a concentrated animal feed, which is the reason for the methane emissions from factory farms, which is the reason for the mad cow epidemic. I don't know how many of you remember that basically sheep had got scrapey and they were dying, so they ground them up and made them sheep feed and cow feed. Then the cow started to die. So they ground them up and the word used for this is called rendering. It's a very dangerous word because it doesn't tell you what, where it started and where it ends. And that's why all these rendering places that America set up after 9-11, they just said rendering, we are rendering so-and-so, you know. You pick up anyone and say so-and-so is being rendered. Well, they rendered dead infected cows and fed them to cows. And then they made beef patties out of it. And when people ate that, 12 people died in England of the CJD. The very, very important point that was realized then, there was no straw to feed animals. There was no grass for grazing. Animals were in factories now. How many of you remember an old film called Soylent Green? Well, it tells you the future we'll have if we don't create another future. 
because if it can be done to cows, it can be done to us. And already, I think large numbers of people are being denied their right to real food and therefore to real health. But the GMOs also contaminate. So in Canada, a farmer called Percy Smizer, his field was contaminated with GMO canola, Roundup Ready canola. And Monsanto started a case against him. He said, but I never took your canola. But the problem is, if you allow a patent on a gene, in the case of Canada, they don't allow a patent on a plant, but they allow a patent on a gene. And the fact that it's in a plant means, in effect, that plant is also theirs. So, if you have a patent on a gene, then its occurrence anywhere without the permission of the patent holder is an intellectual property theft. And having contaminated Percy's field, Monsanto sued him, $200,000. We intervened with many other organizations, and the case went all the way to Supreme Court. At the Supreme Court, they struck down the fine, and there was a minority decision which said, but we should knock down the patents on genes, because if you accept patents on genes, this kind of thing will happen. And the others said, well, if that's the law, then that's the law. And in the corridors of that case, I remember a statement was made by the Monsanto lawyer which said, if it's through con contamination, we are going to control the crops of the world. That's what we're going to do. 1,500 cases were put against American farmer after contamination. Farmers' fields were contaminated, but farmers were sued. There's a very good report by the Center for Food Safety. I know Andrew Kimbrell hasn't come this year, but he's been here in the past. Um, Monsanto versus U.S. farmers. The report, I, the book I was reading out from is my 30 years of work on biodiversity and intellectual property. It's called Origin, the Corporate War on Nature and Culture. So far published in India. I don't know if ever in the U.S. you're going to have a debate on patents on seed. Uh, it's been a very big missing part of both the environmental movement as well as the health movement. It's like, it's a central piece of control, and yet it's the part that is not in the public discussion. There should have been a huge outrage, because at the time when we were rejecting these patent applications saying, no, it's not an invention. In the US, an American farmer called Bauman, had been buying seeds of soya bean from an elevator and planting it. And his case went from the lower courts all the way to the Supreme Court. And I could not believe the decision of the Supreme Court because he was saying, but I've just bought the seed from an elevator and planted it. I did not buy GMO seed from Monsanto. So how I, could I be infringing a patent issue? And the ruling in the Supreme Court, which someday should be challenged in some creative way, says a seed is a self-replicating machine invented by Monsanto. That's in the Supreme Court decision of Bauman versus Monsanto. Go and read it. The seed is a self-replicating machine. And I think that's really the issue of this ecological worldview of interconnectedness and the mechanical worldview of the plant is a machine and the fertilizer is fuel. Our bodies are machines and food is fuel. I go to schools very often to interact with young ones. And because our textbooks now are all just copied totally, I ask, I say, what's food? It's the fuel that runs the machine, that's our body. Look at what's now, if it's just fuel, it doesn't matter, does it? If it's biofuel or biodiesel or diesel or gas, it doesn't matter. But because the body isn't a machine, it matters. What you're putting into it and how it was grown and where the seed began. 
the new work that's coming out, I mean, we always knew just by the fact that we save our ancient seeds. We don't call them heirloom in India because they're not, I mean, they are our normal seeds. That's what farmers have grown. We just call them native seeds of farmers varieties. I also call them open pollinated and open source seed that can be shared and exchanged and multiplied freely. You have one seed, it can become a thousand. You have one seed for the millets, which are my favorite crops. The green revolution had made the millets, backward grains, primitive grains. Our work is showing that we could feed, we could grow 400 times more food. And the millets use 250 millimeters water, no water. They grow on the most rough territory and give you the delicious ragi and the delicious jangora. And, you know, when I started to save the seeds and I encouraged farmers to save seeds, they'd grow the stuff and the markets had been killed. So they'd say, but now you've got to help us with the market. So I'd load the grain in my jeep and take it to Delhi. And I'd call up friends. I said, come and take the organic millets. They'd come and say, but we don't know how to cook it. Next time I'd bring my farmers with me. You <laughs> see, have a cooking class in our office. And then we realized, within the city, they don't want that nice jangora kakichri, you know. So my colleague Maya started to do what she's done, new ways with old grains and ancient grains. And uh, now we can do everything with ragi. I mean, we can make a dosa and we can make a pizza. And with jangora, we can make the most amazing rice. Why are the millets called millets? Any guess? Because one seed gives you a million seeds. That's what's common in the family of millets. The tiniest and tininess of the grain and the huge multiplicity. Now, can you imagine the abundance and generosity? So we do gardens with school children. And every garden is a sanctuary. So I remember going back to a school and I asked this little boy. Um, so I said, well, what did you learn most? He said, Akka, you gave one tomato seed which I planted. And it gave us so many tomatoes. And we ate and we ate and we ate. And I saved a few for seed. And there's still hundreds of seed from that one seed. So much. We should never feel poor. The seed has the lessons of abundance. The seed has the lessons of generosity. Because if I've grown my rice and I share some of the rice seeds with you, I'm not poorer. Monsanto thinks it's poorer if someone shares or someone saves. And therefore, it's not just an ontological contest between creation and the destroyers. It is an ethical contest. Or will the greed of a poison cartel of three define what's the right thing to do for the planet, for our neighbors, for our children? We get a lot of old women coming to the Navdanya stores. And they will say, I come back for the dal, because it's the first time since my childhood I can get that taste again. Now, taste is not an empty, subjective experience, contrary to Descartes, who thought there were secondary quality and primary qualities. The problem is the primary quality is just length and height and weight. Now, you can have rubbish of the same length and height and weight, or you can have more rubbish with more weight which is the category called yield. And we've been made fools of in seed breeding by focusing on yield, which produces huge quantities of nutritionally empty toxic commodities. But our body is asking for something else. A, it's not asking for nutritional emptiness, it wants nutrition. 
So our work has shown that, for example, the native varieties of wheat that we have saved have 9% protein. And the Green Revolution varieties of Punjab have protein so low that they're getting rejected. 4% and less. Now, one of the big cases that I had to deal with was a case of Monsanto pirating ancient Indian wheats, which do not contribute to gluten allergy. I've given this phenomenon the name biopiracy. I call it the second coming of Columbus. You know, Columbus landed here and said, I've discovered America. Now it's ours, the Europeans say. The second coming of Columbus is when Santa says, I've invented the seed. And very often, when they steal our knowledge, they've invented the knowledge. So the first case I had to deal with was of biopiracy, was the case of Neem. Now, the Neem campaign I had started in 1984 immediately after the Bhopal disaster. And the Bhopal disaster <laughs> was because a pesticide plant had leaked. And I said, we don't need to kill people for pest control. And the campaign I started was, no more Bhopal's plant in Neem. Ten years later, I find the name has been patented. And it took 11 years. I joined uh, two other women, the head of the European Parliament, as well as uh, the president of the EFOM, which is the international organic movement. We joined hands and fought this case. I took 100,000 signatures of peasants and women and scientists from India to say this is a case of biopiracy. It was the first time such a case was brought to the European Patent Office. And it took us 11 years. But we defeated the WR race and the USDA of this biopiracy patent. <laughs> and I, I remember this very clearly because it was 8th of March, which is Women's Day, and the hearing was held, and then the judges said, come back after lunch. Now, you don't know the level of Monsanto's influence, which is all over the place. And, you know, it could have been on that bench, too. We come back after lunch, and the judges just smile and say, happy Women's Day. You won. Because you were three women. We fought for 11 years with no money. Just love and friendship. Because every time we are made to feel poor, for lack of money, we have to remember relationship, community, commons is the alternative. The stronger we are in our relationships, the more we can do together. We don't have to buy life. Life is not for sale. That was our slogan in Seattle when we stopped the World Trade Organization. And I, I remember walking down the street and there was this young student carrying a book, my book, Biopiracy, saying, I'm here because of this. I said, I'm here to stop it too. <laughs> and we stopped the WTO in 1999 in Seattle. They were calling it the new constitution, that they would own all life on earth. And what does it take to not allow this ownership of life itself? The first is to be alert. I talked about the Neem patent. There was an attempt to patent the Basmati. I'm from the Dune Valley, and the Basmati from our valley is very famous. And a company called Rice Tech in Texas had patented it. The plant, the seed, the grain, the length of the height of the plant, the elongation quantity of the grain, and even the aroma, which is in the plant. And we did a campaign. I, I did the legal cases, but I also did a campaign. And I went to Texas. And we did a campaign where it, it was not, the, you know, the quick days. They did postcards. And the postcards said to USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office, 
She said, if you do not strike this patent down, we will have to rename you the United States Piracy and Theft Office. <laughs> and in the third case of our patent fight, it was Monsanto which patented an old Indian wheat variety because it does not contribute to gluten. Now, many people think wheat leads to gluten allergy. Wheat does not lead to gluten allergy. Industrial wheat breeding and industrial mechanical production and processing is what leads to gluten allergy for two reasons. First, with industrial breeding, you have uniformity. And the minute our gut faces the assault of a uniform molecule, it feels it is under attack and it responds with allergies. Allergic reaction is a defense mechanism of our body against what it sees as an invasion. So the uniformity of breeding and the breeding to increase the elasticity for industrial processing has increased the enhanced the expression of gluten. So it's not that there isn't gluten in the Indian wheats, but it's not expressed, it's silenced. So Monsanto found this out and took a patent. And, and this patent said, the dough, all products, the seed, the grain, everything would be theirs. I trotted after the European Parliament again with a challenge. And it was snow, it was heavy snow, stumping with my sari through the snow. And the head of the European Patent Office comes out of the office to greet me. I said, what a pleasure to see you again, Dr. Shiva. I said, you should be thoroughly ashamed of yourself that we've had to return to fight a biopiracy case. Your office should not be granting biopiracy patents after the Neem case. This pattern was struck down immediately. The other one took 11 years to fight. So the next time you want to deal with gluten allergies, you won't have to buy Monsanto's product. This wasn't a genetically modified wheat. Just a stolen pirated wheat. The new work on health is showing that all native varieties have much higher nutritional benefits, including huge phytochemicals. That's where the taste comes from. Because I've realized now that food is not stuff, food is not fuel. Food is communication. And good food is communicating, communicating well with our gut microbiome. And bad food is having a terribly nasty conversation. And all the diseases we are seeing are really a result of the fact that we forgot that food is living. Hippocrates had said, let food be thy medicine. In Ayurveda we say, annam sarva oshadhi. Good food is the cure for all diseases. And diseases from bad food can't be cured by anything. So we are at this evolutionary moment of our future where we can look ahead and redefine our future by shedding all the misconceptions that have led us down this path. I, we've just done a new report And I, I, I had to do this because such rapid changes are taking place in agriculture. I called it the future of our daily bread, regeneration or collapse. I'll talk more about the planetary implications tomorrow. But I want to tell you that having failed in the new, in the old genetic engineering, you know, you got BT crops that gave you super pests. You had Roundup resistant crops that gave you super weeds. So what is the solution they're finding to dealing with super weeds? Hmm? No, but when a Roundup isn't working, so they can't spray more Roundup. No, they've gone 10 steps ahead. Bill Gates and 
DARPA, the Defense Research Agency, have joined hands to deploy what is called gene drives, which is genetic engineering to drive species to extinction. Now, one of our sacred crops in India is the amaranth. We eat it as greens. We eat the grain. It's called Ramdana. We eat it during fasting. It's the ceremonial food in all our festivals. The Palmer amaranth has become the most dominant weed in the Roundup Ready fields of America. So in this report of DARPA, and I have an article on this on the amaranth, they talk about, you know, rats and they talk about mosquitoes, but there's one plant they address, which is the amaranth. And there's a footnote to the study that you should use gene drives to push the amaranth to extinction because it's now become a superweed. Well, there's an option, stop spraying Roundup, stop putting the evolutionary pressure and it'll become an, a plain old amaranth and not a superweed. And instead, they want to drive it to extinction. There's a footnote, an asterisk. And there will be food security implications for countries like India where they eat amaranth. Not only do we eat amaranth, the Mexicans. It's the ultimate sacred crop. And it was banned. When the Spanish conquered, it was made illegal because they saw in amaranth the connection to the sacred. And when a baby is born, a little tortilla of amaranth is put on the head so that the baby is communicating straight with the divine. And even though this was made illegal, this was a practice they never gave up. So gene drives, extermination by deliberate intent, I think it's a crime. And the second group of new GMO technologies is what they called CRISPR. You might have heard of gene editing. And uh, Bill Gates is big financing in this, and I always say, but Mr. Gates, life is not a word program of cut and paste. It is far more complex, far more self-organized, that cut here and paste there will have huge consequences. And I want to read out to you some of the consequences that the scientists working on CRISPR are telling us. So the spin is that this is an absolutely precise tool. Using molecular scissors to cut DNA means scientists can edit genomes more precisely and rapidly than ever before. Doda, Dudna, who's one of the uh, people, has found out that now, let me give you this one. A study on CRISPR found that 1,500 single, single nucleotide mutations and more than 100 larger deletions and insertions had happened with one gene editing. One gene editing, 1,500 unpredictable changes in the genome. And uh, in a recent study, for sight restoration in blind mice, the unpredictable generation of these variations is a serious concern. They've been doing CRISPR babies in China. I don't know if you found, read about that, and now they found out there's an American scientist who was involved in, in this experiment with hubris. There are patterns already on CRISPR gene editing. In, the, in Europe, it was ruled that this is a GMO, it will be regulated as a GMO. In your country, they had a one line saying, it is not a GMO and will not be regulated. So this is the next generation. And it's based on totally false claims. So the company that was rushing into healthy food, you're going to see, you're going to see a lot of natural appropriated by the industrial agriculture and food system. You're going to see a lot of use of all the things you've done as a community on healthy eating, 
appropriated. And in one example is by this company called Calixt. Calixt. And, and they were coming out to say they were going to give you the ultimate. They were going to make low trans fat soya bean. Now the trans fat is made when vegetable oil is hydrogenated. It's not in the plant. But they're going to do miraculous low trans fat soya bean. With fraud like that, that's how your shares go. Interestingly, <coughs> all the shares are coming down right now. So we are being invited by the earth to go back to the real seeds that give us real food and real health. And we've done the work of seed saving in India. We build the movement for seed saving in India. But I believe everyone should be a seed saver. And you can be a seed saver in two ways. Either act, if you're a farmer, get involved in, in turning your farm into a farm of diversity by growing diversity, you're saving seeds. But even if you're in a town, see, take one little pot and take your favorite plant and put the seed of that favorite plant and say, you, I will protect. Your freedom is my freedom. Your life is my life. Choose your favorite plant. And we now do a lot of research. So there have been many generations. You know, the farmers were breeders. Open pollinated crops, open source seeds bring so much more nutrition. We are just starting to scratch the surface. We're just starting to scratch the surface on the fact that a small size can often mean higher health. That size is the wrong measure for food. Nutrition is. In Sanskrit, we actually have a word for bad food. It's called a bhakshya. And I say food has become anti-food because seed has become anti-seed. Seed is supposed to give life and all your technology is directed at ending the life in the seed, then that seed is not going to give you the food that nourishes your life. We realize that because we are in periods of climate change, we need to co-create with the earth to allow evolution to be able to be a response for resilience. So we do evolutionary breeding and we do participatory breeding. And women peasants are doing this all over the country. They used to. The seed banks were always managed by women. And the grandmother used to go and put a little string on the particular grain head that would be the best seed. And then we were turned into consumers of seed. And we turned into consumers of food. And we're forgetting what seed is and what food is and what the relationship between the two is. So we do not just the actual breeding, we do the seed saving, we do the breeding. We are beginning networks of exchange, very high level, because the seed famine that started in this country is being brought to our country. And wherever there's a crisis, it's because of the seed famine. And just like we don't need to have food famines, we don't need to have seed famines. We also organize courses. I do a particular course. These are the postcards that fell. It's A to Z of biodiversity, agroecology, and organic food systems. Every year, 1st to 30th September, at the Navdanya farm, where the mornings are the cutting edge science. First on the living seed, no, first on living food systems, living seed, living soil, and living economies. And you know, I've, I've grown up, I've born in India, grown up in India, and, uh, you know, off and on you suddenly wake up to a turmeric, which also was biopirated, and that's a big case too. Um, and suddenly you can go to Starbucks and have a turmeric latte. But we've grown up with this diversity of food and 
Food is diversity, just like the planet's health is diversity. Food is diversity. I'm going to develop much more of the connections between the diversity of the earth and the diversity in our food and how central it is to health. If you start to realize how much the earth has given us and how little we're using, we used to grow and eat 1,200 species of plants. Till industrial breeding, industrial food and global trade reduced it to 10 globally traded commodities of nutritionally empty food. Spreading disease, not health. We have to bring diversity back. And some of the diversity is not even cultivated. What Monsanto calls weeds and kills with Roundup is very often food. We do some festivals of just the uncultivated wilds. Just go around the farm and collect in whatever we did not sow as a crop. But it's grown. The amaranth, the batwa, you call it lamb's ears, I think. My grandmother used to make the most amazing dishes of it. And in Punjab, they treated it as a weed and tried to wipe it out, except that it became a super weed. You know? um, bringing diversity back and bringing life back to our farms is the way to bring health back onto our plates. I'm going to leave some of these cards outside. You can also visit the navdanya.org website. And as I mentioned, you can visit the website of Seed Freedom, which is what shows that Monsanto and the Poison Cartel are so desperate that every once in a while they try and pass a law to conquer an entire country, to make local seed saving illegal, and therefore the only seeds in the market will be their seeds, because they now control not just the GMO market, but the non-GMO seeds too. So they did this in Europe. The European parliamentarians wrote to me and said, there's a new law. Um, we think it's seed, but it's not mentioning seed. I said, send it to me. I'll read it. It was about seed, except that they've started calling seed plant propagating material. Like it's raw material. I read it. I made corrections, sent it back. They made 1,200 am amendments. But we did a journey, a seed pilgrimage, something I do very frequently in India, but we did this one through the parts of Europe which are biodiversity rich. Greece, Italy, France. By the end of it, this law could not be passed. Similarly, in Chile, in Colombia. In California, they were going to make it illegal to save, to exchange seeds beyond a three-mile boundary. And the uh, regional parliament called me, and the local activists called me, what do we do, what do we do? I said, go to 3.1 mile and exchange the seed and do a seed satyagre. The seed satyagre is the way we have defended the freedom of the seed in India. It's the way we have spread the defense of the freedom of the seed all over the world. And when I talk about seed freedom, I'm talking about three freedoms. First is the freedom of the seed to continue to evolve on its own terms. Something like a terminator technology is a total violation. Something like a CRISPR is a violation of the seed to be able to organize its own mechanisms of how to evolve. The second freedom is the freedom of all the species that make the seed and are supported by the seed. So when you have toxic seed, you're not going to have butterflies and bees. So the freedom of the seed includes the freedom of the bees. It includes the freedom of the earthworm in the soil. And the third freedom, of course, is the freedom of human beings as growers of food to be able to save and exchange quality seed, whose quality is known by them through their history, as well as the freedom to eat real food from real seed. These are the freedoms under threat. The reason I'm very happy to have joined you for this conference on the real, I think real is better than fake, 
fake news, fake food. <laughs> Truth is better than falsehood and health is better than disease and destruction. So let's work together. Thank you.